Luke chapter 1, verses 46 through 55, we have a psalm that is attributed to Jesus' mother, Mary. Now, according to the account in Luke, this psalm was Mary's response to Elizabeth as she went to visit Elizabeth. If you remember in the story, the moment she came to Elizabeth and she, she spoke, at the sound of her voice, Elizabeth's baby leapt in the womb. Right? And, and, and uh, Elizabeth said, my goodness, uh, you know, uh, future generations shall call you blessed and started praising Mary. And then out of, the, out of that, Mary responded with this song, with this song, with this psalm. The psalm itself echoes the song of Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. In which Hannah proclaims, My heart exalts in the Lord, my strength is exalted in, God, in my God. So you can kind of almost hear the, 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 the echo from Hannah to, to Mary's song. My heart exalts in the Lord, where Mary says, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. So the two are, are very close. And this psalm that Mary uh, recites is called the Magnificat, which is Latin for the first line of the psalm. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my, uh, and my spirit rejoices in my God, my Savior. So the line, the, the name Magnificat actually is Latin for my soul magnifies the Lord. Magnification. And this is perhaps the difference between Mary and Hannah's met, uh, song. Hannah, on the one hand, <coughs> exalts or jumps for joy in the Lord, um, and, and, uh, and, her, and she's rejoicing in the Lord because the Lord has answered her specific prayer to God. If you remember the story of Hannah in uh, 1 Samuel, she is rejoicing because she has prayed unceasingly to God for what? For a baby, for a child, right? She could not have a child. And, and she was living in, in a household full of wives who had children, and she was being treated like a worthless person because she couldn't have a child. And you have to understand that in that day and age, for a woman to not have a child rendered her worthless to society. And so there she was, childless, praying to God, just give me a child and I'll do anything. I'll dedicate that child to you if you just give me a child. And so the Lord hears her prayer, hears her sorrow, and gives her a child. And so she exalts and jumps for joy in the Lord, and she, and she is just filled with happiness and gladness because now she has her purpose. And not that I'm saying it's, it's wrong to find your purpose in having children. I think children are a beautiful and wonderful thing. But it's sad that society rendered women to that, to that kind of extreme. That if you didn't have a child, you were worthless. So there she found her worth and God answered her prayer. Mary, on the other hand, did not want to have a child. I'm sure at 14 years old, unmarried. In fact, having a child was going to be a costly affair for Mary. Yet she puts her trust in, in God and then proclaims, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely all generations shall call me blessed. But getting beyond the warm and fuzzy and cozy and familiar feeling of this well-known Christian story, Christmas story, how can Mary pray this prayer? Given the circumstances, a 14-year-old, it would be like Katie, you know? Katie or, or Sarah, how old are you? 15. 15, almost. So in, on either side, it's like Katie or Sarah one day just becoming pregnant. How would she be treated in today's society? How would they be treated in today's society if that happened? But here, in Mary's day and age, she gets pregnant, no father to claim the baby, 
And what does the law demand? That she be stoned. And yet she's praying the prayer, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, and future generations shall call me blessed? <laughs> Isn't that a curse to be made pregnant at 14 years old in a society that forbids unmarried 14-year-olds to get pregnant? Isn't, isn't that a curse to be stuck with a child that was, to no fault of her own, going to cost her everything? Her society would shun her, if not kill her. Her fiancé was certainly not going to accept her, since it wasn't his child, which by any normal person's reasoning, you would start to think, okay, who did you sleep with, right? Like, how can you say that the Lord made you pregnant? This just doesn't happen. I mean, I've heard, it's, it's like the dog ate my homework, but worse, right? Like it's, the dog ate my homework is possible. And yet she says, future generations, all generations, shall call me blessed. Now, not only would her, it cost her in that time and in that place, not only would it cost her as a result of, you know, being a 14-year-old kid who's pregnant out of wedlock, essentially, but it was going to cost her even far more than that. Because she would see her son grow up and become a prophet who dared to preach against the Roman and religious powers that be. Not that that was unusual, because that's what prophets did. And there were many before him and many after who did the same thing. But she, as his mother, and as many other mothers had seen with their children, she would be forced to see his arrest, his brutal torture, and excruciating and humiliating death. There her son would be up on a hill for all who come in and out of Jerusalem to see this is what happens when you mess with Rome. Yet future generations will call her blessed. For Mary, the blessing was not in her becoming pregnant, as some would interpret it. It was not in her having a son, which inside the marital covenant would have been considered a blessing to any woman of the time period, because daughters were seen more of as a burden that you had to sell off to some other husband later on in life, and hopefully, hopefully they brought honor to you by having a child, because if they didn't, oh my goodness. So a son in that day and age would have been a blessing had she been married. But the blessing wasn't there. And the blessing was not in who that son would or would not be. Rather, the blessing was that God chose her. A nobody. A peasant girl from Nazareth who was no more than property to her family. That God chose her to bear witness to God's presence in the world, literally, in the baby boy she was carrying. She had no possible way of foreseeing what the future held. And for all she knew, the future wasn't going to last much longer than the showing of her baby bump, as they call it, right? Because in that day and age, that was a scourge. Yet she saw it as a blessing. So often do we look to the skies for God. So often do we look at God as being big and huge and almighty. We look to God like a larger-than-life Zeus, wielding fiery lightning in his hands, ready to zap down anyone who walks in the church who shouldn't, right? Like, that's the common image, like, uh-oh. Yet Mary reveals 
and truth to us. That God is revealed to us not in strength, not in power and in glory, but in someone small and vulnerable and insignificant and weak. And I bet you, you're thinking I'm talking about Jesus, right? The baby Jesus. But I'm talking about Mary. God is revealed to us in Mary as well as Jesus. Because in that day and age, Mary was small. She was insignificant. She was vulnerable. She was weak. And yet God chose her. Both in Mary, who was only a 14-year-old teenager, and in her weak and vulnerable baby son, God's presence was not only revealed, but was magnified. Now, when you magnify something, that typically means it's really small and you need to blow it up so you can see it, right? That's how it works typically. We look at something in a microscope or under a magnifying glass and we blow it up and magnify it so we can see it and see it in detail. And Mary is saying, ah, my soul does that to God. My soul magnifies God and shows the world that God is willing to choose somebody like me. Now, Mary did not mean for her song to mean that only she was a magnifying glass for God. It, she didn't mean that she was the end-all magnification of God, but that her soul did, in fact, magnify God and show us a truth of who God is and what God's character is and what God is all about. So Mary didn't mean to say that we are all, or that she is just a, uh, the only one-stop magnification of God. But if we look at Mary and how she praised God for <coughs> the craziness that happened in her life, if she could see something like a pregnancy out of wedlock uh, as God's blessing, something that would show God's power, in what ultimately looks like weakness. And we are all called to see and be such things. If somebody is insignificant and as vulnerable and as weak and as, as um, small as Mary, if somebody like Mary can magnify God, then we who are not as small and as insignificant and as vulnerable and as weak, certainly can do the same. God is calling us all to be magnifying glasses. We are all called to magnify God. We are all called to bear witness to the real presence of God in our lives. And if we answer that call, if we, like Mary, put our trust in God and answer that call, then we too will be called blessed. And we will, like Mary, be called a blessing to others. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we, uh, we thank you for Mary, for your lowly servant, a peasant girl who took on the world in her weakness and in her vulnerability, a peasant girl who dared say yes to you in a culture that would have begged her to say no. Lord, open our hearts and minds so that we may do the same. 
that by her example and by the example of her son, who bore the ultimate witness of your presence and your love to us here on earth, open our hearts and minds to be such a witness that we can rejoice and claim that we do, in fact, magnify you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.